Welcome, friends. This is Economic Update, a weekly program that looks at the prices we pay, the wages we get, our incomes, the government, international trade, all the economic dimensions of our lives. I'm your host, Richard Wolf. I've been a professor of economics all my adult life, and I currently teach at the New School University in New York City. And I also write columns for a whole host of different publications, including an important website, truthout.org. This is an independent source of analysis and news that I would urge you to give a look out at truthout.org. If you're interested in this program, the analysis we offer, the documents we refer to, please use our two websites that are devoted to making all of that material available to you 24-7 at no charge. The first one is rdwolf with two Fs dot com. And the second one is democracy at work dot info. Both of these websites also allow you to do two other things that may interest you. First is to communicate with us, to tell us what you think of the program, criticisms, suggestions, we read every single one, and we use them to design the content of each program. And we also select two or three questions that we respond to at the end of each program. But I'm happy to say we get many more emails and questions than we could possibly answer. So we ask you to understand if your question doesn't get answered or answered right away, that it's a selection process where we try to design a balanced program and we have to simply choose. The other thing you can do on our websites and by means of our websites is follow us, which we hope you will do. Follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Pinterest. Just go to our websites, click on any of those, and you can follow us in a regular way that way. Let me turn then to the updates for this week. My attention was caught early in the week by a poll commissioned by CNN, uh, the network that is familiar, I'm sure, to many of you. Uh, it asked the ORC, O-R-C uh, Corporation, to conduct a poll, which was done toward the end of January 2014. And the poll asked over a thousand Americans, randomly selected, uh, what they thought the government should do about the distribution of uh, income uh, in the United States. And the results were very interesting, and I want to discuss them with you. First of all, two-thirds of Americans indicated that they believe that the government should actively intervene in the economy to make the distribution of income less unequal than it currently is. That is, an overwhelming majority of Americans want the government to make this a less unequal economic system. Now that itself wasn't what struck me so much. What struck me so much was CNN's correctly pointing out that the same numbers were collected back in 1983. That's right, 30 years ago, under Ronald Reagan, Two-thirds of Americans also said they wanted the government to intervene to make the distribution of wealth and income less unequal than it was at that time. Well, then here's an interesting thing for us to think about. Between 1983 and last month, the distribution of wealth and income in America has gotten more unequal, not less. So what the majority of the people wanted in 1983 has not only not come to pass, but the situation is worse today in terms of inequality than it was then. And yet the same two-thirds, the same overwhelming majority of Americans are displeased. They were displeased in 83 with the inequality then, and they are displeased with the greater inequality now. Well, how do we understand this? Well, the Republican Party, and all the folks who think that way, 
uh, they don't want redistribution of wealth. They don't want to do what the majority of Americans clearly want them to do. The government for the Republicans is not to be in the business of redistributing income. And so clearly, to the extent that Republicans shape what the government does, they bear some responsibility for the fact that the government has not done what the two-third majority of the people wanted. In fact, the government has presided over a worsening of the situation. The Democrats are different. They don't exactly say they favor redistribution. They seem afraid to do that. But they do little things, whether it's a food stamp program or an earned income tax credit. They do things that help people, particularly in the middle at the bottom, somewhat. But clearly the Democrats, like the Republicans, have not only failed to carry out what two-thirds of the people want, but they too, the Democrats, like the Republicans, have presided over the last 30 years in an exact opposite program, opposite to what people want, because we haven't increased equality, we have in fact increased inequality over that time. So what's the lesson here? Republicans and Democrats, although they differ, do share common responsibility for not doing what the majority of Americans clearly have wanted. They wanted it in 83, they wanted it in 2014, and from everything we know, they wanted it for the whole 30-year period between. But neither party delivered. Both parties are disconnected, unresponsive, to what a clear, indeed overwhelming, majority of Americans want. So I guess the only conclusion is this one. Not changing our inequality, in fact, allowing inequality to become worse, must serve the interests of somebody, because the Republicans and Democrats are seeing to that. They are not doing anything to support what two-thirds of the people want. They presided over a government that did not interfere in the growing inequality. Those who favor growing inequality, obviously, are overwhelmingly those who benefit from it. The big corporations, the wealthy, the 1%, the 5%, lots of ways of describing them. Their interests were served by Republicans and Democrats alike, as inequality got worse over 30 years, despite the majority being against it. Second update that I wanted to talk to you about has to do with events this last week in both the House of Representatives and in the Senate in Washington. Looming over both houses of Congress was the government's situation that it no longer could borrow more money, which the government must do since the government is spending hundreds of billions of dollars more than it takes in in taxes, which it's been doing for years now, and therefore it has to borrow money. But in order to borrow money, it has to get a law through Congress because it has borrowed up to the ceiling established the last time the Congress dealt with this question. So the president, as Republican and Democratic presidents have done many times over the last 30, 40 years, goes to the Congress and says, please raise the debt ceiling limit so that the government can borrow more money in order to spend on the programs you, the Congress, have passed for us to spend on. The Tea Party, the right-wing portion of the Republican Party, has been denouncing any raising of the debt limit unless what they want, which is a cut in government spending, accompanies any such allowance of the government to borrow more than it currently is allowed to do. And interestingly, both Mr. Boehner in the House of, Repu uh, in the House of Representatives and uh, Senator McConnell in the Senate, Republican leaders, decided that they did not want to be responsible for another shutdown of the government because the government can't function 
in many ways if it can't borrow the money to pay, whether it's a soldier's salary or a highway worker's stipend or a college student's loan or all the things the government does, it has to borrow part of the money to pay for it. If the ceiling isn't raised, if they're not allowed to borrow more, the government stops functioning or at least reduces its functions. The Republicans didn't want to be responsible for the bad consequences in the public mind when they are pointed to as the ones who caused the government to stop sending out Social Security checks, paving roads, and all the rest. So the, con the less conservative Republicans, the elders they're often called, the non-Tea Party folks, they voted with the Democrats to lift the ceiling. They did it in the House, and they did it in the Senate. And the president either has already or will shortly sign it. And so the government will not need to shut down. The government will have, for another year or so, the right to borrow more money, and the government rolls along. This is a defeat for the Tea Party folks, uh, particularly, for example, for Senator Ted Cruz from Texas, who rail against all of this. So I wanted to look into this with you. Why is the debt of the United States something that right-wingers would be so determined to talk about, to focus on, even to the point of shutting down the government to prevent it from going further into debt? Because, as the Tea Party folks believe it, this debt is such an important problem. Here's why that's bizarre. The debt of the government, the deficit of the government borrowing more than it takes in, has been shrinking quite quickly over the last year and a half. So if ever you didn't need to put quite the pressure on that point, it would seem to be now as the borrowing of the government is being reduced rather quickly. Doesn't seem to matter for the Tea Party folks. Number two, you might imagine that rather than worrying as your priority about how much debt the government is running, you might be more concerned with the millions and millions of people out of work. Maybe the government ought to borrow money if what it means is to put people to work. That is, to take a person who's feeling bad about himself or herself because they have no job, give them a job, make them feel much better about themselves, have the rest of us benefit from the work these people are doing and the wealth they are producing, have us all benefit because the tools and equipment these people are working with would have otherwise sat there gathering rust and dust, and that we would be also glad that the wealth these unemployed or formerly unemployed people were producing could now be used to improve our cities and improve our society. Why isn't that a more important set of issues than the debt level of the government? Why are we not concerned about climate change, about the droughts and the storms and the obvious changing in our climate upon which our very lives depend? Why isn't that a major concern? Where did it come that the debt is so important? But it's actually more bizarre than that. Let's grant for a moment that the Tea Party folks are right to focus on the debt. I don't think so, but let's give them the benefit for the moment. There's an easy way to reduce the government's reliance on debt. Let's be real clear about this. The government borrows money to carry out its functions because the taxes it raises are insufficient to pay for what the government is doing. If you're concerned about government debt, one clear way to reduce or remove the government's need to borrow anything would be to raise taxes on corporations and the rich. Now, why do I choose them? Because they're the ones who've tax whose taxes have come down the most in the last 30 and 40 years. In the 50s and 60s, the tax on the wealth, the highest tax bracket on the wealthiest people was 91%. Today it's 39%. That's a big tax cut. For the mass of middle and lower income people, they've had no tax cut, anything remotely like that. In 1945, 
Corporations paid a dollar fifty in income taxes on their profits for every dollar in income taxes paid by individuals. Today, that ratio is for every dollar raised from individuals, the income tax raises twenty five cents from corporations. So the answer is clear. If you're honestly concerned about the deficit, strange as that might be, one of the honest ways to deal with it that should be discussed is raising taxes on corporations and the rich so that the government would get the money it used to get from them and therefore be able to pay for what it does without borrowing. But you notice that the Tea Party folks never say a word about that. It's as if they wanted us to believe that the debt is the great problem and the only way to deal with it is by cutting government spending so the government doesn't have to borrow. Well, it doesn't take rocket science to understand that in the end what the Tea Party is about is making government smaller. That's their idea of what to do in an economic system that's facing a six-year crisis where the inequality that people are really upset about has gotten worse. All that the Tea Party can think of is to demonize the government, blame it for everything, and make it smaller and poorer. That may work for folks who don't want to think the issue through. But if you understand what this is about, you couldn't take that kind of argument seriously for five minutes. A short update, and yet an important one. This one comes from France, even though the lessons about the world are all there. A remarkable event is taking place in France among voters. Shooting up in the polls, getting more and more support, is something called the National Front, whose leader, Marine Le Pen, uh, taking over from her father, who built that organization, Le Pen, L-E, capital P-E-N, uh, is a remarkable testimony. Why? Because the National Front is a fringe party of the right. That is, it gets a few percentage points. Uh, it has therefore been around French politics for decades. Uh, and in that way, it has some similarity to the parties on the far left, uh, who also have been around a long time and who also get a few percentage points. And both of these fringe parties are different from the two major parties. There's the French conservative parties. Uh, they were the ones who had the government under Nicolas Sarkozy, and then there are the socialists who currently control the government under François Hollande. In France, the conservatives and the socialists are the equivalent of what in England would be the conservatives and the Labour Party, or what in the United States would be the Republicans and the Democrats. And people are turning away from those major parties. Why? Because those major parties have been exchanging government First this one, then that one, like in the United States, Democrats and Republicans, or in Britain, Labour and Conservatives, so in France, Conservatives and Socialists. Both of them have presided over the capitalism that really crashed in 2007, and both of them have been sharing government ever since, making sure that the crisis lasts when nobody wants it to, making sure that inequality gets worse, even though, as we've just seen, that's not what the majority in any of these countries supports. And there's beginning to be the predictable reaction of more and more people. We don't want business as usual. We don't want the status quo. We are losing in that status quo. We have been losing, and it is getting severe. So they're looking for an alternative. And here's what's so interesting. In France, the left wing can't bring itself to take a strong, clear position against the status quo. They keep talking about raising taxes on wealthy people more than they are now, should sound familiar, doing a bit more for middle and lower income folks than is being done now, should sound familiar, 
being better for folks than the conservatives, but not offering any fundamental break with the system as it has been evolving. And since the earlier promises by socialists in France never really dealt with the problem, you can be clear that the French public is not going to buy it now. So then why is the French public turning increasingly to the right wing? And I think there's an answer there. The National Front doesn't deal with the capitalist economy that's hurting most French people because it's basically unable or unwilling to be critical of the system. But what they do offer is a stark, symbolic break with the tradition. And the way they do it is in two steps. Number one, they want France to withdraw from the common currency, the euro. That's a clear, symbolic break. What exactly it would mean for French capitalism and for the French economy in terms of any basic change? Very little. It would have effects in France, but not to change the basic system. But it's stark, it's symbolic, it's a big break. And the other thing the National Front is in favor of is expelling immigrants, not letting immigrants come in. They're very xenophobic, they're very nationalistic. Since France has been admitting large numbers of African and uh, Middle Eastern immigrants for a long time, this is taking a very stark position against the status quo. So the National Front gets votes because even though it doesn't deal with the problem, people know is their basic problem, an economic system that is less and less for them and more and more for their 1% even though the National Front doesn't touch that subject, rather like the Tea Party doesn't touch it. Nonetheless, people are drawn to it because it is at least in some way starkly opposed to business as usual. In France, it's by being anti-immigrant and anti-euro. In the Tea Party, it's by being anti-government, no matter what it is. These are distractions. These are false issues. To, to pander to people's upset with the economic system without ever naming that system to be the problem that it is. And the left will not be able to be a real competitor to the right, to the Tea Party here, or to the National Front in France, unless and until it takes the real dramatic step of naming the system as the problem and being a party that will change that system in a fundamental way that addresses people's actual economic problems, concerns, and fears for the future. We turn now, as we often do at this part of the program, to a major issue. And the one I want to talk with you about before we have our mid-program break has to do with an irony. Here's the irony. Politicians are debating whether or not the middle class is in problem, uh, having some sort of problem here in the United States. They debate that, and then they debate what are the best measures we can take to make sure that our middle class remains strong and firm, and all of that kind of rhetoric. And likewise, economists and other academics are debating in the papers of their journals and in their books and in their conferences and colloquia. Is the middle class uh, in trouble? Where is it going? What's going on? As if this were an unsettled question, the status of the middle class, its continued viability, or whether the country is really splitting into a tiny minority that are very well off, 1%, 5%, 10%, maybe even 20%, and the vast majority that's in trouble and in economic difficulty with no end in sight. And the interesting thing is that while the politicians debate and the academics debate, the business community is finished with the debate. It's not debating anymore. It's made the decision. And I thought you might be interested in my going through with you in a way that a number of commentators have also done, the reality that business has already understood and that can help us cut through the quasi-phony debates of politicians and academics to the reality 
they still don't want quite to face. So let's begin. One reality this last week was announced in New York City when a famous discount clothing store, Lomans by name, closed, closed its doors, and in one symbolic step, turned over in the Chelsea neighborhood of New York City its location to Barney's. What is Barney's? It's also a clothing store, but it's a high-end, very expensive clothing store. Notice, the discount store chain Lomans goes out of business and is literally replaced by a store basically designed for upper-income people. But there are many more examples to drive this point home. Consider restaurant chains. Two that pander, or serve, depending on your point of view, middle and lower income people, the Red Lobster and the Olive Garden. I'm sure familiar to many of you. The average meal in the Olive Garden has a tab of $16.50. Ever since the year 2005, the number of people going to the Olive Garden has shrunk every quarter. That's right. Americans who wanted to go to Olive Garden, who pay sixteen fifty on average, tab per person, can't afford it, aren't going. And it's not that they're going somewhere else at an equivalent price, they aren't. But here's the contrast. Another chain, Capital Grill, that some of you may know of, is different although often located in places not so far from the Olive Garden and the Red Lobster. The average tab at the Capitol Grill chain is $71. It is growing like gangbusters, 4-5% uh, per year, year in and year out. How remarkable. Here's another example. The Wynn and Venetian uh, casinos in Las Vegas doing a booming business. The casinos in Atlantic City, upstate New York, and rural Connecticut, not so much. One panders to upper income spenders, and the other pander to middle and lower income spenders. In New York City and elsewhere, the Four Seasons and St. Regis hotels, doing very well. They're very expensive. The chain Best Western is in trouble. It can't get its guests in there. General Electric announces that its high-end line of refrigerators, called the Cafe Line, refrigerators costing between $1,700 and $3,000, are doing well. But its cheaper line of refrigerators, not at all. Finally, those symbols of the middle class buyer, J.C. Penney and Sears, are both in advanced stages of economic crisis and decline. Sears is closing its flagship State Street store in Chicago, and J.C. Penney recently announced closing 33 more stores, laying off 2,000 employees. Wow. And here's the best summary of all about the retail sector. At the high end, Nordstrom, a de department store uh, based in San Francisco, is doing very well. And at the extreme low end, the dollar stores, they're doing well. What's disappearing is the middle. And all these stores are changing their strategy, all these companies, because they are beyond the debate. They have seen walking into their stores and not walking in that the money is concentrated at the top. The buyers are the top 10, 15 percent. Everybody else is either not going to buy or heading to the dollar store to spend what they have. The American inequality is getting worse and worse.
and the business community has its eye clearly on dealing with that as the reality. It's time to take our mid-program break. Please stay with me. I will be back in a matter of seconds to continue with the second half of Economic Update. Welcome back, friends. This is Economic Update, and I'm your host, Richard Wolff. Before we begin the second half of this program, I want to remind you that we have these two websites where you can get more information about all the topics we deal with here, as well as communicate with us, uh, telling us your thoughts, your suggestions, your criticisms, all very much welcome and everyone read to help us design this program. And finally, by going to our websites, you can click on the Facebook icon, the Twitter icon, the Pinterest icon to follow us on those social media. Okay. I wanted next to briefly discuss with you Germany in Europe because we've touched on it in the past and a good number of you have raised questions both about what's happening in Germany and how we have treated it and I wanted to return to that topic in response to your interest. First, we often discuss Germany here in order to drive home a very particular point. So I want to state it again and explain the role of Germany uh, in this particular regard. Germany provides a very extensive and generous program of support to its people. Whether it is a national health service that is very well done and, and a public pride for Germany, far beyond in its quality uh, anything offered in the United States and so on. Or it's the German program of helping families, or it's a German program of public pensions, or it's a whole host of what's called their social democracy or social welfare, what is called the United States a safety net. The Germans are very generous in providing that to their people. They tax high and they provide a real program of massive public services. And likewise, they have a strong and effective labor movement. I mention that because the Germans have done better in the last crisis than any other European country and much better than the United States. For example, their unemployment rate went down from nine, uh, 2007 to the present, straight down. Not like ours zooming up and now barely halfway back. So their story in terms of providing jobs for their people, much superior to that of Britain, France, Italy, Spain, the United States, and so on. And the reason this is interesting is, in the United States, England, and other places, the argument is made that you cannot afford to provide good services to your people in a time of economic difficulty so that if you want to get out of the crisis, you have to cut back on the services you provide. That's what is happening in Italy, in Spain, in Portugal, in Greece, in England, in the United States. And the argument is that's a necessity. There could not be any way to thrive in a crisis unless you cut the benefits to your people drastically. The Germans are a clear example that refutes those arguments. They've done better than the countries that savagely cut their standards of support, even countries that didn't provide as much support as the Germans ever did. And the Germans haven't done anything like that. Oh, they've nibbled away at it. There are forces in Germany that want to reduce that safety net, but they haven't been able to do it anywhere near what's been done in other countries, and it hasn't hurt their recovery. In fact, Germany proves that you can do very well, thank you, and sustain your safety net. That's important to understand because it breaks the back of an argument that you have to deny people decent wages and decent services in order to have a viable economy. At the same time, Part of the reason 
that Germany is able to do well in the crisis and thereby to sustain its generous program of public services is precisely because Germany has behaved very sharply competitive and sharply antagonistic to most of the rest of Europe. The Germans, in their relationship between their capitalist enterprises and their working classes, their unions, have been able for a long time now to keep down prices. They, give, they say to the workers, we're not going to give you a big wage increase, but we will guarantee you work. And if we don't raise your wages, then we won't have to raise prices as much as we otherwise would to keep on getting good profits. So if you help us, the capitalists in Germany said, by keeping your wage demands moderate, we will in turn keep our prices from rising, while all the rest of us around Europe are in fact facing rising prices. What that meant over the last 25 years is that the prices everywhere else in Europe rose relative to what they didn't do in Germany. They didn't rise. And so all over Europe, people who wanted to buy something stopped buying the French, the Italian, the Spanish product and bought instead the German. Why? Because Germany had figured out a way to keep its prices from rising as quickly as they rose elsewhere in Europe. In effect, Germany, during a time of crisis after 2007, where this became very stark, Germany was displacing the economic chances of producers in Spain, Italy, Greece, and many other places through this price policy. So as the crisis savagely attacked those other countries, Germany was basically pretty good because it could keep producing, selling to the people who weren't buying anymore from Spain, Italy, Greece, Portugal, and so on, but were buying instead Germany. The problem with this strategy is it only lasts for so long. Eventually, the damage done to places like Spain, Italy, Greece, Portugal, and so on, means that the people there are no longer switching from Spanish goods to Germans, because they don't have enough money to buy either Spanish or German goods. In other words, the decline of the rest of Europe, particularly the southern part of Europe, is destroying the very market for German goods that up until now allowed Germany to do better than the rest of Europe. And as the squeeze on Germany's exports to all those other places takes its toll on the German economy, as it's already doing, you're going to see inside Germany the replication. As German capitalists can't make as much money selling their goods around the world as they used to, they're going to be squeezing their working classes by cutting government programs to save their taxes, cutting their workers' wages. In other words, you're going to see happening to Germany what has really only been the delayed impact of the global capitalist crisis. So Germany is a complicated situation, and I wanted to make sure it's understood that that's the case not that Germany is either a good guy or a bad guy. It's Germany is doing its strategic moves inside a declining and crisis-ridden capitalism, and that's what we observe when we watch the reality there. But it's a very different reality from the stick figure caricatures, for example, here in the United States, where we need to forget about Germany, lest our people understand, wow, you could have a generous social safety net, and do better than the American economy. The next big topic that we only have a little bit of time for that you've also asked me to talk about is the Soviet Union. That's right, that regime in the Soviet, in Russia, that existed from 1917 to 1989, that period of Russia's history called the Soviet Union, and you've asked me to talk about it and I think you're right, and I should. And the reason I, I agree with you 
in asking me to do this is because the Cold War, that period of history when the United States and the Soviet Union were classic enemies, uh, fighting proxy wars, bumping up against the risk of nuclear war, is really now 20-odd years behind us. It should now be possible to talk about the Soviet Union without the hysterical, overdrawn, inaccurate uh, debate, which is a more polite word than, than it deserves, this heaving at one another of crazy accusations because we were wanting our people, our respective people, to hate each other and dislike each other. We're beyond that now. We're not enemies in the way we once were. Cold War is behind us. So let's talk a little bit about what the Soviet Union was and wasn't. And it's not only a question of being interested in history. The Soviet Union represented an effort to go beyond capitalism. And around the world today, as the capitalism that we have is rendering so many people unhappy, critical, angry, and interested in looking at options, going back into the recent past to take a look at one effort to do something differently is a logical place for people's interests to go. So let's, let's begin. Was the Soviet Union the end of private property and private enterprise, which has been how it has been mostly portrayed? And the answer is absolutely not. This is not a question of theory and interpretation. This is a simple matter of fact. For example, the, one of the first things done in the 1917 Soviet Revolution by the new leaders there, Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, and so on, one of the first thing they did was distribute the land of Russia as the individual private property of Russian peasants, Russian farmers. They distributed the land as the private property of the land. Not only was there no abolition of private property in the land, there was the exact opposite. Private property was distributed to the mass of the Russian people in a way that had never happened before. It's really more accurate to speak of the Soviet Revolution as an enormous increase in private property and land, and land, let's remember, at that time in Russian history, was the most important productive resource. The vast majority of Russian people in 1917 were farmers, lived on the land, lived off working the land. What the Soviet Revolution did do is take away private property from industrial corporations, industries. But that was a small part of the Russian economy. So they abolished private property in industry, uh, but they extended it in agriculture. To summarize then, the majority action that affected most Russian citizens coming out of the Soviet Revolution was more private property and private enterprises on the land, not less. If you didn't know that before, that's because the Cold War prevented a reasonable and balanced understanding of what the Soviet Union was. In summary then, what the Soviet Revolution did was establish and extend private property in agriculture and curtail it in industry, a much more nuanced and complex understanding than the absurd extremities of the Cold War. And the second example of how the Cold War distorted things is the idea that in the Soviet Union they abolished the market and substituted planning. This again is stone cold wrong. What happened in the Soviet Union was that planning by the government took an important role in society, not instead of markets, but in most cases as a, an existing side event. In other words, you had markets and planning, not planning instead of markets. The planning was the big overall picture, but in all kinds of parts of Soviet society, Markets existed throughout the history of the Soviet Union. Many kinds of products were left 
to producers who would make them on their own and sell them in local markets to people who would come and buy. All kinds of market transactions occurred, even among industries, where the government didn't prevent there being a market, but what the government did is control and constrain prices. But lest that strike you as bizarre, let's remember that in the United States, we also control and constrain prices. For example, we have a minimum wage. We don't allow the market to work in, so that people can be paid less. We put limits on what utilities can charge for electricity and water and telephone services. The government intervenes to control prices in markets. The Soviet government did that as well. So the notion that there are no markets in socialism or communism of the sort that the Soviet Union represented is simply wrong. Well, if it wasn't the abolition of private property, the way it was alleged, and if it wasn't the abolition of market and market exchanges, the way the Cold War often alleged, well, what exactly was the Soviet Union, and how was it different from the United States? I hope this beginning of a discussion has been interesting enough for you, because next week I plan to answer that part of the story to look again at the Soviet Union to see what really was established there other than the caricatures of no market and no private property, now that we know how silly that is, to see what the Soviet economy really was like, how it worked, and what the problems were that eventually made it implode. In the final 10 minutes of today's program, I want to turn to respond specifically uh, to some of your questions. And one uh, question that several of you have asked me in different ways is this one. You've read that the Federal Reserve recently issued documents suggesting that it would stop pumping money into the economy at the rate it has been doing once its target rate of 6.5% unemployment was reached, as if 6.5% unemployment is where we are okay, where we have succeeded, where we no longer have to do the kinds of anti-crisis interventions that have been the norm now for six years. And some of you know historically that over the last 40 or 50 years, at various times, the government has listed 4% or 5% unemployment as the target, a kind of rate, you might say, beyond which we don't need to go. Be less than that, we don't need to have as a target. Let's talk about that for a while. Do we really need to have 4, 5, or 6.5% unemployment? Let's remember what it means. Millions of people without work. Huge amounts of tools, equipment, raw materials, sitting idle, wasted. And all of the output that those unemployed people could be producing if they were working with the tools, equipment, and raw materials that we have available. All that output that could solve our poverty problems, rebuild our cities, and really make America a better place. So what are we saying when we say we're okay with not pushing beyond 6.5%, 5 or 4% unemployment? Let's think a little further. Suppose that there really are jobs there for all these people, but we just sort of haven't uh, gotten them together. Then the obvious question is, why haven't we gotten together the people who want to work with the jobs if they're there? I mean, with modern computers, we ought to be able to fit the workers into the jobs. And even if the worker isn't fully skilled for a job, find something productive that a human being can do. It isn't all that hard. And producing something, even if it's not the best that a fully skilled worker would do, is a lot better for that worker who's working and for this society who's getting the fruits of his or her labor than having them sit idle, feeling bad about themselves, losing their skills, and wasting all those resources. Well, suppose the private sector jobs aren't there. Suppose they really aren't the jobs, and current science and current investigation suggests that there aren't jobs for at least two-thirds of those people looking. Well, there aren't jobs in the private sector. Why in the world don't we have a public jobs program? Rebuilding our national parks, 
taking care of our elderly, providing quality daycare for young people. There's an immense array of functions the government knows we need, the people say we want, and that those unemployed people, if the private sector can't hire them, hire them in the public sector just the way Roosevelt did in the 30s. Well, why isn't it done then? Why don't we put together the workers with the private jobs, and why don't we create the public sector job? What's the reason here? This is what I want to get at. Why don't we have full employment? That's right, half of 1%. That would be reasonable. That's the friction of people coming and going from a job. So at any given moment, they might be unemployed, but they're really only unemployed because they left job A and are on their way to job B. That way we don't waste 5 6% of our people and our resources and all the output we could get and need and want. Why don't we? And I think this is the answer. Because if you have full employment, if workers are all working, then those capitalists, those employers who want to expand and grow, they're not going to be able to do that without bidding a worker away from whatever job he or she already has to come to that employer who wants to grow. And the way an employer would have to do that is to induce an already working worker to come. And the way you do that is you raise the wages. In other words, full employment or nearly full employment makes the worker in a better bargaining position with the employer. Better able to say, hey, I'm being called from other places who are offering me higher wages because they're growing. If you want me to stay here working for you, Mr. Employer, you're going to have to raise my wage too. In other words, either because another employer hires you away or because another employer might hire you away at any moment, workers are in a better position to get rising wages. And that's why a pool of unemployed people 3%, 4%, 5%, we can debate that. That's good for employers. It's good for employers because every worker can see the unemployed in the neighborhood. Every worker has to worry that if he or she gives up their job, they might be among the unemployed. It's not a situation where you get a job tomorrow if you quit your job today. That's what full employment would give you. But we don't get that, and that's not because we can't because we don't have the technical facility, because we can't think of what to do with these people. That's not true. The explanation is the business community, the employer community, doesn't want to face the conditions that would exist if you had full employment. And you know, the academics figured that out. But in their usual way, they kind of changed it. In economics, we teach students about something mysteriously called the Phillips Curve, named after a British economist named Phillips. And the Phillips Curve says when you reduce unemployment beyond a certain point, say 4, 5, 6 percent, then you get an inflation. Prices go up. This is an interesting story. It makes it kind of magical how this would happen, but there is no magic. Here's what the Phillips Curve tells us. When unemployment gets very low, when people are working and jobs are everywhere, Workers are successful in pushing up their wages, and capitalists respond to having to pay higher wages by jacking up the prices. That's why we have an inflation when there's low unemployment. And how would you deal with it? Childishly easy. You don't permit the prices to go up. Then when the workers have full employment and the wages go up, the prices don't. And you know what happens then? The profits go down. The employers have to pay higher wages, but they can't jack up the prices to cover themselves to pay the higher wages. They have to take a loss in their profits. Now you know why we keep unemployment at 3, 4, 5 percent. Now you know why we condemn millions of our fellow citizens to the horrors of unemployment and all that it means. This is not a technical problem. This is not an economic problem. This is a problem about those who run this society, the employers, not wanting to face a hurt to their profits. A different economic system that didn't make profit the bottom line wouldn't need to have 
an unemployment problem always with them. Thank you very much for your attention. This is Richard Wolf, Economic Update, and I look forward to speaking with you again next week.